so as we start the year today, we are in the book of Jude. Uh, some of you are like, what? Jude, J-U-D-E. That's that book at the end of the Bible, just before Revelation. Um, and as I was thinking about where Jude is, I said to my wife, I used to enjoy it when we actually used to have Bibles, proper Bibles, because you kind of see all the Christians. Where is this book? But now everyone has a device, you know, you just kind of quickly find it. So would you just uh, click on over to the book of Jude? And so one of the things that we know as adults is that the start of a new year doesn't mean the change of things, right? If you didn't have money in 2022, you don't suddenly go, happy, and you have a lot of money. If you were a grumpy person or a sad person in 2022, you don't jump into this celebrated year and begin to have fun. No, life doesn't work like that. You know, but every time I listened to that song, Imali Enini, I was praying as they were crossing over that God, can I wake up with a wallet a kumbile? You know, God, can you just cause a miracle to happen? But though we know that nothing changes in our lives because of the change of a year, most people walk into a new year with hope and expectation. Somehow we think that things are going to be different this year than they were last year. But how many of us know that in order to do that, we need to pursue different principles? We need to live life differently this year than we did last year in order to see the good that we hope to see. So if you want to be a happier person, you need to fight for your happiness. You might need to get rid of some things or even some people out of your life so you can enjoy life. If you want more money, you might need to hustle for a new job or start a business so that money comes your way. But all of that is encompassed around one word. You have to fight for things to be different. You have to fight for things to change. And that is what the author of the book of Jude, Jude, is going to double down on this morning. Fighting. Jude, verse 1. This is only has one chapter, so we're reading the first three verses. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are called, loved by God, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once and for all. And because Jude is somebody we don't really come across in Scripture, let me just give you some background information on him. Jude, that name is a Greek word for the word Judas. And he's the brother of James, James who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. James also wrote the book of James. And so both Jude and James start off their letters by saying, we are servants of Jesus Christ, telling you two things. Number one, we believe that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord, but that we are also on his mission. We are all out in serving Jesus Christ. What's fascinating about these two writers, Jude and James, is that they are in fact the half-brothers of Jesus Christ. So this is a family affair. And if we go on to the book of Matthew, we see them being mentioned. In Matthew 13 and 54, he, Jesus, went to his hometown and began to teach them in their synagogue so that they were astonished. And they said, where did this man get this wisdom and those miraculous powers? Isn't this the, car the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, Jude? And aren't his sisters with us. So where does he get all these things? And they were offended by him. Matthew is writing about the crowds that really didn't want to receive from Jesus. But I love that last line. It says, and they were offended by him. The funny thing is that they weren't the only people who were offended by Jesus. His own siblings were offended by him. Because Mark in Mark 3 says the following, Jesus entered a house. A crowd gathered again, so, so that it was impossible for him and his followers even to eat. Talk about a house party. When his family heard what was happening, his family, his brothers, his sisters, they came to take control of him, 
they were saying he's out of his mind. And so can you imagine being Jesus growing up and your siblings are always saying, this one is local. That's what they believed on, of him. But somehow after Jesus' death and resurrection, both James and Jude see that Jesus is in fact the Messiah who was promised by God. And they put their trust in him. So from disregarding their brother to now worshiping and serving him. I think there's hope there. Because for some of us, we've been praying for cousins and friends to be saved. And nothing has changed. But if James and Jude could be saved after living with Jesus and not regarding him, but when their eyes were opened, they put their faith in him. That says those that we are praying for, as long as they are alive, there's an opportunity for salvation. So don't give up. Don't give up. Don't stop praying because God does open the eyes of the blind. But let's move to the topic at hand. And so as Jude starts his letter, he identifies the audience that he's writing to. He says, to those who are called, loved by God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Jude pinpoints his audience in God. So he's writing to Christians, he's writing to fellow believers, people like me and you. So he says, as believers, we are called. That reminds us that God knew us before the foundation of the earth, and he called us to be his children. You see, sometimes we need to be reminded of this, that you're not an accident you didn't come across Jesus accidentally. No, God called you. And that is where your identity should be. Not in your degrees, not in your job, but that I am a child of God. He called me. I am special. I am precious to him. But then he says, we're not just called, we're also loved by God. Loved by God. A lot of people wrestle with God loving them. Because we think God loves us only when we do good. Or that how I know God loves me is when things go my way. So when I sin, I begin to doubt God's love for me. But also, when there are setbacks in my life, when things aren't going my way, I tend to think, God mustn't love me. But Jude reminds us, he says, you're called. And the reason you're called is because God loves you. That is why scripture reminds us in that simple verse in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. And so that needs to sink in this morning, that God loves us. God says to those who don't believe, those who are yet to be believers, I love you. And I want you to see my love in my son, Jesus Christ, that I sent him to come and die on your behalf. But then if you are a Christian, God says, I love you and I want you to experience that love. How, God? Paul in Ephesians 3 says to the church in Ephesus, I want you to understand God's love. The height of it, the length of it, the breadth of it, the depth of it. God's love is measurable. God wants us to receive it in its fullness. And that's my prayer for you, even as we begin this year, that you would sense the love of God deeply. That you would move in the love of God. And then he says, we are kept. We're called, we're loved, and we're kept. That says that we will see Jesus. I don't have to worry about that. But then because Jude comes back to this point at the end of his letter, I'll leave it for week number four. So he places his people in God. Here's your identity, child of God. You are called by God, loved by God, and kept by him. And then he pronounces a blessing over them. He says, may the mercy, peace, and love of God be experienced. That's his prayer. May they experience mercy, peace, and love. 
And so if you are short of prayers this year, this is a good prayer to copy. God, may your children experience your mercy, your love, and your peace. But then we get to the busy part or the crux of the letter. In verse 3, it says, Dear friends, although I was eager to write you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once and for all. So Jude is saying, Bazalwane, I was about to write you an email so to postulate about this wonderful salvation that we have. Paul has done a few I thought I should chip in. But as I was beginning to type, something interrupted me. Something got my attention. And instead of writing about the great salvation we have in Jesus Christ, I've decided to write you a long WhatsApp. Luba would know about that. The brother can write long WhatsApp, so yo, bro. Now, those who write WhatsApps want you to get that message urgently. They don't want you to say, I, by the way, because you know how it goes. I send an email, and I must still phone you that I sent you an email. Look for my email. He wasn't concerned about the church kind of figuring out. What are you saying? No, no, I've sent you an urgent message. Look at it. This is what Jude does. His, urgent was so message, uh, well, his message was so urgent, yet it was so simple. He says literally this, fight or contend for your faith. Fight or contend for your faith. Now this word contend comes from the world of wrestling. And I know you guys, some of you are thinking WWF, WWE, no. We're not talking about that kind of wrestling. Real wrestling. Okay, we understand? There's a picture up on the screen to help us with that. To contend means that you will be in close proximity to the person that you're fighting. Your fight will be continuous. It will be costly and agonizing. To contend means that you'll be in close proximity to your opponent. Your fight will be continuous. It will be costly and agonizing. In fact, the English word to agonize, which means to cause extreme mental or physical pain, comes from the same root word as the one Jude uses. So Jude says, we are to fight, we are to agonize for our faith. And I could get into a whole lot of Greek, what this means, what that means. I thought I should turn the tables over to you. That when you hear the word agonize or fight for your faith, contend for your faith, what comes to mind? And you know me, I don't like, I don't like talking to myself, ne? so I put a mic there, and I would that you would indulge me. Take a second and think about it. When you hear the words contend for the faith, what comes to mind? Um, to contend for your faith for me, I think it will mean that uh, you'll be tempted in every area of your life, particularly in the area of disbelief. Um, we look at the three temptations that Jesus faced, and he had to quote scripture as is and apply the appropriate scripture to what was being thrown at him. So I think as believers, maybe that's what we need to do, not to walk into a warfare as an unskilled swordsman, but apply the sword appropriately. When you first mentioned uh, what we thought, the word struggle came to mind. <clears throat> and you also mentioned early on the internal struggle. And I think that's often something that we don't want to identify clearly that there's a struggle within us, as you said, uh, maybe we're not worthy of God, we don't think we're worthy, we haven't done enough, if we come from a traditional religious background, it's all around on works, and so the struggle is there, and the struggle doesn't go away, but the other word that comes to mind is that stand firm, and if you want to struggle in the faith, you need to stand firm on the foundation in Jesus Christ. 
And the struggle won't go away, but you will be, won't be on your own. And it's, that's the only way you're going to contend for the faith, standing on the rock of Christ. I think I mentioned um, last year that I contended for my faith a lot in this past year. And it was in just get of myself to wake up every morning, take a chair, go sit outside, and speak the word of God to myself. Just simple scriptures from the Psalms and, and other parts of the Bible and just speak it out loud to remind myself of what I believe. That for me was fighting for my faith. Yeah. Uh, when I think about this, um, boxing has rules. Fighting has no rules. <laughs> and that's when you say content for your faith, I'm thinking about that. The adversary, the devil, does not have rules. He fights. And we have to be ready for that. If it means biting him, we have to. <laughs> and so for me, if you, we are not, as uh, Sifak was saying, if you are not skilled, we are not going to fight. We'll be waiting for the referee to come and uh, say um, <clears throat> to your corners, there are no corners here in the faith. We always fight. We, that's why the Bible always says, always pray. Amen. I think for me, um, very similar to my dad, to agonize, I also feel like it's a constant struggle or a constant battle. That what stands out to me is how you mentioned how much God loves us. Whether we're doing the good, good things, the right things, following his ways. But to contend for your faith also means to reach out to God, to draw near to him, then he draws near to us. Uh, so I think for me, uh, when you said fight, I just realized how complacent I've been. I just assume that the world is in support uh, of my faith. I just assume that social media is going to encourage me somehow. I don't realize that uh, the world is not neutral. Um, it's not um, a kind of a, a space that's welcoming of my faith. Um, and so um, the fight is very much getting in the ring. And I like what you, the, the, the picture there around my opponent is near me. So somehow I, I sometimes think my enemy is far away somewhere and uh, it's, it's not a daily struggle. Yeah. Amen. We can all go home now. I think we can. So if you're visiting us, uh, we do this uh, every now and then where we engage with God's word together because this, this is not a monologue. It's for all of us to grow together, just to kind of get some understanding around the, the question and letting the congregation participate in that. You said something, uh, Rendani, at the end. The world is not on my side. You see, I think for too many of us, when we think of contending for the faith, we think of the world out there. And so as long as the world is supporting us or at least allowing us to meet on a Sunday like we are, there's no need to contend, right? We can carry on believing what we believe, sing our songs, preach and do whatever until when they begin to fight us. That's when we contend. This morning, my focus will be on how we are to contend a bit closer right here. You see, the believers that Jude was writing to were facing persecution, like so many other believers at that time. And so when he writes to them to remind them that they're called of God, they're loved by God, they're kept by God, that gave them the chops to withstand persecution. So they knew that no matter what happens to us, no matter how bad things get, we are loved by God, we're called by God, and we're kept by Him. Let's encourage each other in that way. For us who are not facing persecution, when we are reminded that we're called by God, we are loved by God, we're kept by God, is to protect us from two dangers. From complacency, 
and capitulation. You see, in a free world, the, the world that we live in, this free world that we live in, where we don't face resistance for our faith, we can become docile. We can think, oh well, everything is going my way. And many Christians have found themselves drifting from complacency to capitulation, not realizing that they are outside of where God would want them to be. But I know those of you in this room who are biblical scholars and you're like, but yeah, Jimmy, Jude doesn't talk about that. His concern is about naughty pastors and naughty Christians. Why are you talking about us being complacent? Why don't you just stick to the text, they would say. Yes, and that's true. Jude gives us specific details of how to deal with the naughty pastors and the naughty believers. But for now, I thought it would be wise that before we contend out there, we fight here. You know, like they say, let's keep it here. Let's keep it here. Let's come a bit closer. Because here's the bottom line. Jude says, you need to wrestle with your faith. You need to get serious. You need to get dirty. You need to get messy with your faith. He tells those guys that, hey, you need to get messy because you're being persecuted. And for us who have the temptation or the tendency, I could even say, to be complacent, we need to contend for our faith on a daily basis. I love how one author summarizes Jude's words. He says, on your feet, the time for leisure is past. Contend, agonize, exert maximum effort. The Christian faith in all its fullness and completeness is worthy of your struggle. It's worthy of your struggle. So if all of us were to assess our faith lives, the question would be, when was the last time we contended for something? When was the last time we wrestled with something? You see, I'm not talking to believers who are super spiritual, who are healing people and doing all kinds of things. I'm just talking about in your everyday life as a believer, when was the last time you wrestled with something? When was the last time as a family you said, we will not allow this to carry on? Can I give you a few examples? You see, as Christians, we aren't in danger of serving the idols of our culture. There are many idols. We've spoken about this so many times. But because we're so close in proximity to the idols of our culture, sometimes we allow them to dribble us or to trip us up. In a city like ours, we know that the word busy defines 5 January to 16 December. If anyone asks me about my calendar from now until 16th of December, it's one word, busy. And we wear it as a badge of honor. We are busy, busy, busy. Just last week, I was having a conversation with somebody and I said, hey, how was your time at home? They said, rested. But you know what? As I was driving into the city limits of Jersey, I felt that spirit in fact, that twin spirit of busy and rush come on me. And for so many of us here, what ends up happening is that these twin spirits of busy and rush hold us down. They hold us down every single week that when we get to the weekend, we'll go, oh, what can I binge on? Anything. But we never go to Jesus. We shared in December about peace and rest. Do you remember that? But the question is, how many of you have made a decision to find rest in this year? Because Jesus says, you will find those in me. You need to be intentional about it. That in the midst of everything that will happen this year, and a lot of stuff will happen this year, Interest rates will go up, they'll go down. This will happen, that will happen. You might even lose your job. In the middle of all of that, have you made a decision to contend for peace and rest? 
are you going to wrestle so that you find yourself in the arms of God? Some of you have allowed the spirit of fear to intimidate your life. You are fearful. Afraid that you don't have enough money. Afraid that a loved one will die at some point. This is afraid of the future. You are scared. It keeps you up at night. During the day, you're always trying to figure out what's going to happen. What's this? And the spirit of fear has got you down. But God's word says, for I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. That's what Jesus says. So in a world where it's okay to be scared, are you contending for your faith? Declaring and standing up on what God says and not what culture holds as supreme. Child of God, we've got every reason to be afraid. There's a war happening somewhere in the middle of the world right now. They say there's a, another variant of COVID coming around the corner. The guy at Eskom was almost killed. Hey, we've all the reason to be afraid. But God is calling us through his word to contend for our faith. That we have to renew our minds. To pull down the strongholds of fear that want to plague our lives. Let me move on from there. In a time where everything is available to us, where we have unkept internet, where you can get your groceries in 60 minutes, where everything seems so easy. The question is, how do we contend for self-control? Because for so many of us, because things are available, we gorge on them. Because things are available, we choose to do it. And this is not to knock on anyone, so I won't mention any company. But I grew up in the age of, well, I grew up before the, the age of dial-up. Even before that, you know that sound, then ISDN came in. And so, I had no temptation with binging a TV show. You couldn't. You had to wait week after week. You had to literally drive to the grocery store. And you didn't have a license, so there was no car. Because you didn't have a license. Not some of you guys who your parents buy your cars. That didn't happen for us. And so, I didn't have to wrestle some of the things that we wrestle with. But because we are in a free access society, even as believers, we're beginning to act like the world. Living without self-control. And God calls us to a life that is completely different from our culture. To a life where, yes, as Paul says, all, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I'll not be mastered by anything. And that is how you show the culture that I'm counter whatever's happening. I'm not just going to partake in it. But finally... When were you last in close quarters with sin? Where you took time to survey your life, identified sin, and then said, I'm going to fight against that sin no matter what. I'm not going to be complacent about it. I am going to fight. It's going to get messy. I might fail a couple of times, but I will get up and I'll keep on fighting. You see, all of us have to grow in sanctification. This idea that, oh, God's okay with me. Yes, God loves you, but he's not okay with you where you are, child of God. He might have found you where you are, but he wants you to move on in him and grow. 
When was the last time you contended against sin? Because here here's what sin does. It puts a barrier between us and God. And when that barrier goes up, we are now afraid to come to him. And after a while, this is true. After a while, I no longer have need to come to him. And I have drifted. And I've drifted. Here's what scripture says to us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from everything we've done wrong. Look at God. So one of the ways to contend is just by surrendering. God, I've messed up. I've, uh, God, help me. This is how you contend. That's how you, you fight the enemy. Hebrews 4, I love this. He says, because we don't have a high priest, talking about Jesus, who can't, who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but instead one who was tempted in every way that we are, except without sin. So because Jesus understands where you are, then he says, finally, let's draw near to the throne of favor with confidence so we can receive mercy and find grace when we need help. So he says, Jesus understands. So contend. Because he understands, he will always give you mercy and grace. Don't become complacent. Fight. Because when we contend, we're saying, hey, we're tired of these small and yana things that trip up our faith. As your pastor, my desire for you this year is that you would grow in God. That you would experience God's love, as I said earlier on, more than ever before. That you would experience an increasing measure of the Holy Spirit that he would work in and through you such that it's visible and tangible to you and to those around you. Now, I know that growing in God is not an easy thing to do. So I'm not just kind of giving you a wish, ah, no, just kind of wish it will happen. No, no, I know it's not an easy thing to do. As he said there, it's an agonizing thing. And we would know that when we contend, sometimes that is more agonizing than delightful. That God, do I really need to be going through this? I could just give up and behave like everybody else. But God, because I love you, I'm going to agonize. Because I know how life is. No sooner I overcome this, that's a problem. I thought I was working on kindness and patience. Now I've got an issue with sanctification. And I'm not speaking from a place of privilege. Because people tend to say, ah, no, the pastor preaches because he's doing it. No, no. I hear you and I feel you about how, about how hard this is. I tend to go on social media as we do these days. And over the last few years, especially over the last two years, I've seen a lot of pastors get out of, get out of ministry for a variety of reasons. One, yes, there was some scandal. But two, a lot of guys have had mental health challenges. And three, some people are just tired of daily grind of dealing with people, man. They're just tired. And they're like, ah, you don't listen to me anyway. Like, what did I preach last year, October? I won? I won? <laughs> whatever the case, whatever the reason the people are leaving ministry, what I know is this. Me contending, do me contending for his faith. He's not writing sermons. He's not preaching. He's not coming to coffee with, with you or praying for you. That's all stuff I should do. Yes, it's part of my job. Bless God. But contending for my faith is walking out my salvation, my personal salvation with fear and trembling. It's so that, as Paul says, that after I have taught others, I myself might not be left behind. And so I wrestle and I struggle. I get messy. I get dirty with myself because I realize that I need to grow in God. And the more I commit myself to Jesus every day, every year, here's what I learn about myself. I am messed up. But 
Because as we read earlier on, this Christian life is worth it. It's worth it. I continue to contend. Friends, if we hope to live this Christian life in our culture, in the way that it should be lived, we have to contend. And where we begin to contend is here first. It's great that you can debate people about Muhammad and Jesus. Great. God bless you. But how are you in here? How are you in here? Now, I know after many years of ministry that after a sermon like this, some of you will feel guilty, feel bad, and you'll do what so many people do in January. They run to the gym. Oh, I ate too much of a December. Yo, mkawa. Yo, festival mkawa. And they run to the gym and they begin to lift the 50 kg dumbbells. Oh, patience. Oh, kindness, righteousness. Yeah. Oh, mm, look at me. And then by Valentine's Day, they fizzle out. Because the chocolates on Valentine's Day were too nice. That's what happens, right? God's word is never meant to condemn us, but to convict us. And conviction says, I am sober-minded. God, you've shown a light onto the issues I have. How do I begin to contend now? And I would say to you, begin in small places. Maybe all you can lift is five kgs. Start there. God, let's begin to contend in this area. And once I've overcome that, I'll move on to other things. This will ensure that I don't fizzle. But also I can think clearly and have a plan for the year and say, God, I would want to grow in these number of areas. So as this year begins, I will say to you, determine in your heart where you need to contend. That how are you going to wrestle for sanctification? How are you going to fight for your health? That is, whether it be spiritual, mental, or physical, how are you going to fight? How are you going to be in pursuit of the miraculous? Over the last two years, we've been talking about being in pursuit. So what areas in your mind and heart, maybe it's fear that God, do you move, do you move miraculously or doubt? How do I contend with that? All too often as people, we wait for things to become serious or bad before we begin to contend. Now when things have gone belly up, we come to church. Oh God, oh God, help us. Let me challenge you in 2023. Begin to contend now when nothing bad is happening. Begin to contend. Wrestle. 